Great. It looks like we've got a critical mass here. So I know we've got a lot to cover. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and uh, get started today. Um, just uh, first of all, um, to start uh, by, uh, by really thanking all of you for being here and great to see um, so many uh, friends and colleagues um, from the, the water, wash and climate sector joining uh, this session today. Um, my name is Kellyanne Naylor and I am UNICEF's Director for Water Sanitation and Hygiene, um, speaking to you today from, uh, from New York. Um, and the event that you're in, hopefully you've clicked on the right one, is uh, measuring climate resilience in WASH services and in communities. Um, so this is indeed a very important and timely topic. Um, and I think it's important to point out, and what for me is really exciting, is that this is an emerging area under development. And I think for many of us who've come to uh, Stockholm over the years, we know that this has been, uh, and the Water Week experience, has been a great opportunity to bring forward emerging work and really work on uh, building it together um, as um, a, a sector with um, partners and uh, being able to share and, and learn from one another. So this topic today, measuring climate resilience in WASH services and in communities, is a topic that UNICEF is deeply committed to. And you can um, know from a child rights perspective, um, we've heard, all heard the code red for humanity. And this is certainly an issue that is disproportionately affecting children, particularly um, in uh, least developed countries. Um, and so the Climate uh, Paris Agreement established in 2015, has a global goal on adaptation of enhancing adaptative capacity, strengthening resilience and reducing vulnerability to climate change. Um, and while advancing with global adaptation is key, there's there still important gaps today in terms of how we review and monitor progress. Simply said, we're still lacking a lot of vital data, um, evidence and the methods to collect them. So we can see with the urgency of the situation um, that there is an urgent need to understand and improve resilience uh, to climate change, particularly in the least developed countries countries that already struggle to provide universal access to basic services and face increasing threats from climate change. So to date, um, in terms of kind of the state of the sector, there is still a lack of a framework to assess the resilience of water and sanitation services, which hinders the development of strategies to improve um, wash services in this regard. And um, I think we believe that just as in the past, wash has been at the forefront leading global conversations on how to monitor progress towards specific SDG targets through mechanisms like WHO and UNICEF Joint Monitoring Program. We also think that WASH can be a leader to pave the way on how to measure our progress towards the global adaptation goal. Um, so really to help us advance this um, thinking on this important topic today, we have a panel um, and a group of presenters who I think are really pioneers who are leading at the leading edge of thinking and doing in this emerging area. And so just to go over quickly our agenda today, we're going to start with the framing presentation by Professor Guy Howard um, coming to us from Bristol University that will explain the latest advances in the development and testing of a framework to measure whether water, uh, drinking water supplies and sanitation in rural areas and small towns are resilient to the future impacts of climate change. We'll then turn to hear experiences from two leading countries, Ethiopia and Nepal, that are already testing this framework and finding um, other ways of, um, of really advancing on um, this important area of work. And then we'll also um, move to a, a panel discussion that will be moderated by uh, my colleague, Tom Slademaker from UNICEF's Office of Statistics and Monitoring and the UNICEF side of the house on the joint monitoring program. Um, and inside of this panel, we're very excited to have uh, representatives from the World Bank, the Global Water Partnership, 
Bristol University and UNICEF, and Tom will be introducing the panel. Um, we also hope, I think as everyone does, that we will have time for a question and answer. So if you do have uh, questions or comments, um, please do um, uh, provide those in the chat box uh, function. Um, and we will try to select a few select questions um, for the questions and answers, but also try to provide some answers during the session to um, in case we have time constraints. So um, with that all in mind, um, we're going to move now to our first framing uh, presentation. Um, and uh, we're so pleased to have with us Professor Guy Howard um, from the Department of Civil Engineering um, and uh, the Cabot Institute of the Environment at the University of Bristol um, in the United Kingdom. So Guy, um, handing over to you. Um, time is always tight. We've got five minutes. Um, so thank you so much in advance. Over to you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Kellyanne. So, as Kellyanne said, what I'm aiming to do briefly here is to talk a little bit about why we need metrics and indicators for climate resilience and to talk a bit about a particular framework that we have been working on uh, together with colleagues in Ethiopia and Nepal. So, <clears throat> first of all, why do we need indicators for resilience? Well, we all know that climate change is posing a major risk to WASH that is way beyond and extends beyond uh, the current concerns around sustainability. And the WASH sector, like many other parts of society, is now starting to recognize that building resilience uh, is essential. But if we're going to build resilience, we then need to have robust metrics that we can use to assess resilience, so we will, can work out whether resilience has been achieved, but also, as importantly, to identify what actions we might need to take to improve resilience. And what's important and increasingly important uh, within WASH and elsewhere is recognizing that metrics need to capture the fact that resilience is multidimensional. And so the works that Bristol has been doing with Haramaya University in Ethiopia and Kathmandu University in Nepal um, have identified six key domains which you need to consider when thinking about resilience. So the wider environment and catchment, uh, infrastructure, management, uh, governance and engagement, institutional support and supply chains. Now, all these dimensions are important. And if we only measure one or two of these, it'll be very unlikely we can really gain a real feel for resilience. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things I should say as we move, move on to the next slide um, is the important issue around resilience is that what we're trying to do is to make sure that we're measuring things that give us an indication um, about how a system may be able to withstand or adapt to, to future change um, and, and change that might be unknown in terms of magnitude or might be unknown in terms of frequency. Um, I'm going to move on. The, the slides are moving on a bit slower. But um, so what do those metrics need to be able to do? Well, they need to be able to capture the multidimensional multi nature of resilience. They need to be relatively simple to, to use, even if they're underpinned by very large data sets. We need to have a transparent system of scoring that can be follow, e, uh, followed easily and used easily. And it can be used to sort of support decision making at multiple levels. Um, so that might be at a national or a subnational level, uh, where we're trying to identify particular communities and regions of highest priority. Um, or we might be looking to identify systemic failures, which require action around designs, policy or regulations. But we also want a framework that can start to work uh, at an individual community or utility level, where we can use as a basis for discussion for action. So the slide you can see at the moment, we've managed to skip over the second one, but the slide you can see at the moment uh, gives an indication about the how tough is WASH framework. Now, what this does for each one of the six domains that I identified earlier uh, is set in place a set of Likert scales that allow to make a relatively qualitative judgment around resilience in that domain, ranging from very low up to very high. Now, each one of these scales is underpinned by quite a lot of data, but ultimately requires some judgment to be made. Um, this gives one example, which is around uh, some of the infrastructure, um, if you want more details around this methodology, um, the, the, there's a paper that was being recently published in MPJ Clean Water, which is open access, and materials will be available on the Bristol website. 
we move to the next slide, please. What this next slide will show you is how you can combine uh, those assessments of the different uh, domains uh, to derive a single score. And, and the example uh, that hopefully will come up on your screens uh, shows you the scoring from two sites in Nepal and Ethiopia. And what it does is it shows you how you can score across the different domains and how you can arrive at a final consolidated score and assessment of resilience, which then allows you to compare between different water suppliers. Um, can we move on to the next slide? I think we uh, have slight issues. Um, the, the, what we can then do by taking those final scores is to put that into a decision-making framework that allows us to aggregate scores up and make decisions or classify uh, supplies as, in terms of resilience ranging from very low to very high. Um, and, and associated with that is then to define uh, how we would prioritize action as to whether uh, priority actions would be very high uh, in the case that we find out that our water supply has very low resilience, or in fact, the priority would be very low because we've determined our water supply already has high resilience. Um, and again, hopefully we can share these slides afterwards. There's a slide there that will show you how you can use that to visually demonstrate um, a range of systemic failures. So uh, I'm going to wrap up to, to talk about future steps. Um, we are working now on uh, guidance material around this metric, and that should be available during the autumn 2021, with both reference and practical guidance being developed. We are looking to test this framework under more operational conditions to check its usability. And we in particular want to make sure we are able to um, link um, our assessment framework into programs directly trying to improve resilience. So thank you very much. I hope that's been a useful introduction um, and I'll hand back to Kelly. Thank you very much, Guy, for this really thought-provoking and I, I'd say visionary presentation um, of really looking at these domains of resilience, um, the metrics that we can use to measure, and I love that it's called how tough is wash. Um, I think this is something you know we all think about when we're working on programs um, in in communities. Is this going to stand um, up? Um, you know, with all of the reflections also on sustainability, um, recognizing um, that the future is so important um, to really reach the impacts of these investments. Um, and it's great to see that you've also um, included this dimension of how we can use the scoring to make better decisions. It's just really um, encouraging to see this. And thank you so much for the update on how we can get um, access to these tools in the, in the future. Um, so now um, let's see how this looks at country level. Um, and I think we're so lucky now to have um, two countries where this framework is being implemented. Um, and we're very much looking forward to hear, learn about their experiences um, and how we see this um, uh, looking forward into the future. And now I think we've lined up um, the first country example to be coming from uh, Ethiopia. Um, and I think we had originally planned for Mr. Um, Siga now uh, Tewachu to be presenting to us from the climate change um, and health expert at the Federal Ministry of Health in Ethiopia. Um, but I understand that there are some connection issues. Um, and so just Guy, I see you, are you um, gonna be making the Ethiopia um, presentation or were we able to connect Abraham, sorry? Not uh, let me just check. Abraham, are you able to connect? Okay, uh, I think the answer to that is no, and I will uh, uh, do the presentation. Apologies, both Abraham and, and Ms. Binor, um are facing connection problems. This is, this is not unusual, uh, I'm afraid, um, for uh, uh, Ethiopia. So uh, I, I hope the slides are going to be able to move on. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing them uh, moving on myself. Um, but I will carry on anyway. Um, great, brilliant. Here we are. So, so the, the presentation that Ms. Kanoa prepared is really to talk about monitoring resilience of wash in the context of drought in Ethiopia. Um, and so to give a bit of background, Ethiopia is the second most populous country in Africa, uh, but globally it's been identified as one of the most vulnerable countries uh, to climate variability and to climate change. Um, 
Now that, that vulnerability is in relation to, to a number of things. Uh, most commonly understood for Ethiopia is drought, and it's something that we would very often associate with Ethiopia. But I think we also need to recognize that actually Ethiopia regularly suffers um, significant floods, um, which can be devastating. But overall, um, it's concluded that the drought is the single most destructive natural hazard. Could you move on to the next slide, please? Um, as we're moving on, I will keep on talking. Um, so the climate projections for Ethiopia suggest the mean annual temperature is set to increase between one to three degrees by 2060. And this is going to be accompanied by more erratic rainfall uh, and increased unpredictability. And what this means in terms of impacts is going to be an increased incidence of drought, um, as well as more intense precipitation events. And that ultimately is going to lead to more risks with flood. So in the, in the government's assessment of vulnerability, health, water and agricultural sectors have been, been the ones which have been identified as most vulnerable to climate change. And for WASH, particularly in relation to drought and in particular, the loss of access to water supply and over abstraction uh, of water resources and in floods uh, in relation to um, seasonal flooding and the increasing risk of waterborne disease and damage to existing water uh, and sanitation infrastructures. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, the key, key, key climate impacts um, that have been identified around water are particularly reduced water quality and quantity, uh, the drying up of key stores of water, uh, including wetlands as well as freshwater so sources, and the disruption to hydropower, which may actually have knock on impacts um, in terms of wash delivery, where that relies, for instance, on uh, submersible pumps uh, for pumping water up from deep uh, aquifers. Next slide, please. Um, next slide gives an illustration of what drought means for the country. Um, and basically, uh, a lot of us will still remember the, the major drought that happened in the mid 80s, but uh, Ethiopia has been subjected to repeated droughts. And what that results in um, is drying up of water sources, loss of land resources, loss of livelihoods from animals, um, and increased pressure on drinking water sources um, that makes maintaining. Uh, drinking water supply access and hygiene extremely difficult. Next slide, please. So in government, uh, there has been a real national movement to start to tackle um, uh, how climate change has been addressed um, through a cross-government initiative through the Climate Change and Resilient Green Economy uh, Unit, which is based in the Ministry of Finance. There's also been work to develop a health national adaptation plan, uh, and to implement climate resilient health and social care um, facility guidance. But WASH has consistently been identified as one of the sectors the government wants to put most emphasis on. And in fact, it, within the policy environment has made climate resilience uh, a major policy objective. Uh, and that's then working through uh, the, one, uh, the One Water National Plan, uh, One WASH, sorry, National Plan, uh, which is a multi-stakeholder platform, which is trying to take forward an integrated approach for achieving universal access to services. And Climate Resilient WASH is now being embedded very much within those areas. Next slide, please. Um, the government of Ethiopia has committed to upscaling the implementation um, of climate resilient water and sanitation safety planning and apply that to all new water supplies and sanitation projects and to retrospectively visit uh, the most vulnerable and highest priority water supplies in rural and urban areas to improve uh, their resilience uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. Um, and in particular, it's identifying the need for improved monitoring uh, because of the concern around extreme events. Um, so there's a lot of investment that's going in to try and improve the availability of information and monitoring regarding vulnerability and that will support decision-making. Um, that will help design adaptive management strategies and to support those to be resilient and to access the existing capacities within communities and health systems to continue to adapt and cope with priority hazards. Next slide, please. Um, I think 
one of the big challenges that, that is being faced, um, and one of the reasons why we selected Ethiopia to work on how tough is wash, um, is there's still limited multi-sectoral coordination, which is a common feature around water and wash. Um, there continues to be limited knowledge around climate change and its impact on wash and health, uh, including how you build resilience and an ongoing need to build up that capacity to understand climate change, data and science. Um, and a real need to continue to invest in monitoring systems. So one of the things that we have found in Ethiopia with How Tough Is Wash is that we can generate very clear information that can be useful and our, uh, for decision making. And our next stages are starting to work much more closely with stakeholders in the country to find ways in which we can roll out its application more widely so that we have an opportunity to learn and refine the, the framework further. So I will stop there and hand back to you, Kelly. I, I hope the slides have been visible to, to people. As I say, if not, I'm, we are very happy to share those later. Thank you so much. That was, uh, yeah, you've really um, jumped in there. Um, thanks so much. Um, unfortunately, I think there is a problem with the slides changing. So I think we'll try to certainly um, from UNICEF side, we'll be happy to find a solution for being able to share the slides. For those of you who are interested, I know, um, I think we're all really interested in both of these slide decks. They're, they're very um, rich with a lot of information. And I think, thanks again. I think it's um, it's a lot to digest um, because it's so comprehensive. I think to be able to look across as you said, the different hazards and as well um, as uh, coping strategies and adaptive capacities. Um, I think it's really, really impressive to be able to see how um, this is being brought together in um, a context as complex um, as, uh, as Ethiopia. But it also shows the importance of this work um, because um, these tools are needed um, now. Um, so moving now to Nepal, um, and and we are so pleased and it looks, oh, it looks like our slides are back. So let's hope um, we've got, we're able to, to, to move through it this time. Um, we have with us today, Professor Subad Sharma from the School of Science at Kathmandu University in Nepal. Um, Professor uh, Sharma, are you, are you here with us? Um, if so, please uh, turn on your video and unmute yourself. Um, and we really look forward to hearing your presentation and um, seeing your slides. Over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. Uh, chairperson of the session, I think in digital world, we see a host, co-host, guest, and there's a remarkable participation today. 68 of you, you are most welcome, ladies and gentlemen not very late night, but still it's night. Greetings to you all from Kathmandu, Nepal. My name is Subodh Sharma, as Kelly has already announced. I'm a professor of environmental health at Kathmandu University. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you, this time it worked. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, nowhere on earth you can find a country with such an extreme original variation say from 45 meter above sea level to 8,848 meters above sea level like that in Nepal. Uh, this is a country with 30 million population and it ranks as the fourth most climate vulnerable as reported by UNDP uh, recently in 2021. Climate change has adversely affected this country by dramatically reducing the water yield in different sources. In one of the studies performed very recently in 2021 by Adhikari et al, 4,222 spring sources were surveyed of which 70%, just imagine 70% showed decrease in water yield. Ground water table is reported to have dropped down from some 30 feet to 150 feet in just two decades. So this is the greatest threat for sustainability of water supply and thereby the hygiene facilities. The picture you see on the slide clearly depicts every year flood situation in, in lower lane and also in mid hills and mountainous region of this country. Next slide, please. 
it's shown in this picture. Spring sources are drying in most of the time of the year, except during monsoon from July to September, when 80 to 90% of the total annual rain pours down only during these three months. The figure to the left on the top shows one of the typical spring source at Ghandruk in mid-hill region of the country. For your information, country is divided into three distinct ecoregions, lowlands, mid-hills or mid lane, and then upland or higher Himalayas. And the photo on the bottom to the left shows spring sources, which start to generate during these three months when 80 to 90% of the rains pours down. It's because the spring sources are drying dramatically, the water lifting from large and deep rivers as shown on the right through swamp well has become very popular. And that also helps in remedy of turbid water that we receive during monsoon season. Next slide, please. So water supply scheme in the lowlands are very robust and mostly they are either shallow tube wells or deep boreholes, which are considered as very prominent. Where it schemes in the mid hill ecoregion or mountainous regions are highly vulnerable to climate change due to landslide spring sources are drying out. And geographically, hills and mountains represent 80 to 85 percent, say on an average, 83 percent of the total land area, where about 53 to 55 percent of the total people live, of which 80 percent is mostly rural. And there you will find mostly, as shown in the picture, community managed water supply schemes. And these community managed water supply schemes, the communities, they are unaware of the risk and mitigation measures, risk due to climate change. Next slide. Next slide, please. So it shows clearly that the traditional water sources and the deep boring water sources in the lowland, when you come here, the one in the lowland with the deep boring, they are more resilient compared to the traditional water sources, which are there in the mountainous and hilly regions, where its spring sources can be placed somewhere in between when it comes to resilience against assessment against climate change. Next slide, please. Having shared that what adaptation measures has been taken at community level, one of the activities that community have accepted is rationing of water pumps for deep boring, such as using one of the deep boring for a certain weeks and followed by other deep boring in the following week. And the other adaptive measures community have taken is identifying some alternative sources for crisis management. And there are some community-led initiatives as shown in the picture on the bottom. The one to the left is a roughening filter through local initiative. And the one to the right is slow sand filter that also through local initiative that reduces the turbidity of the water. And as a result, the water becomes suitable for drinking or for some other purposes. Next slide, please. Now coming to what resilient wash challenges are we facing and how are we going to handle these in future? As Professor Guy has on his presentation clearly indicated how resilience is measured at country level. We are we have already used six scheme and the ranking system from one to five, from low to very high. But and this has clearly documented evidences to measure climate risk to our system. So we have a tool on hand and that tool is going to be uh, used by communities at community level to assess how resilient our WAS systems are. So it is recommended and it is important to prepare the stakeholders against the possible risk and implement corrective actions for the improvement of the schemes in future. Uh, thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Professor Sharma. That was really, really insightful. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's just really interesting and really appreciated to learn more about the Nepal context um, and how you see this um, tool being able to be used um, in your context and also improving the performance um, of the sector in this really important area. So thank you so much um, for sharing that very clear presentation. Um, so thank you and thanks for being with us at such a late hour. <laughs> we really appreciate that. Um, so um, after these really um, excellent, I think, framing presentation and the, the two very insightful country presentations, um, I think we're really learning to see how this monitoring framework um, can be used. Um, so now we're going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Tom Slaymaker, who's going to moderate the panel discussion. Um, Tom, uh, handing over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly, and I hope everyone uh, can hear me clearly. Um, so my job is to uh, moderate our panel discussion, and the, the focus of the panel is going to be on how do we move towards uh, a, a sort of commonly agreed set of metrics uh, for national and global monitoring of climate resilience in WASH. Um, we've, we've heard uh, in the framing presentation, uh, there's a lot of work going on around uh, definitions. Um, how do we understand resilience and its different dimensions? Um, but how can we arrive at uh, you know, a small number of indicators that can be used across a large number of countries, for example? And we've also heard about different potential sources of data, data coming from, from households, from communities, from local authorities, and also, of course, climate information. So what are our data sources going to be, and how do we build the monitoring of climate resilience uh, into national monitoring systems. But also at the end of the day, what are we gonna say about resilience when it comes to monitoring? So if we compile these data and we analyze and we try to track changes over time, um, what sort of change are we expecting to see and what does increased resilience or decreased resilience look like uh, and over what period of time? So those are some questions that we'll try and grapple with on our panel. Um, you've already met Guy Howard, um, who's in the Department of Civil Engineering at Bristol University. Um, but I'd also like to uh, introduce the other members of our panel. So we have uh, Nishta Mehta, who is uh, a water sanitation um, specialist at the World Bank. Uh, we have Alex uh, Similabui, who is the Executive Secretary of the Global Water Partnership for Southern Africa. Uh, we have Bruce Gordon, who is the unit head of water sanitation and hygiene at WHO. And we have Sylvia Gaia, who is uh, a senior water and environment advisor at UNICEF headquarters. So I'm gonna to turn to Guy first. And Guy, you presented a very nice uh, conceptual framework uh, for assessing resilience and suggested some practical ways in which you can start to measure and monitor using a, a, a Likert scale. Um, it's now been tested in, in Nepal and Ethiopia. And I wanted to just ask you, you know, which aspects of resilience do you think are the hardest to define and measure? And I don't just mean in terms of the resilience of WASH services, I mean also uh, the sort of climate information that we need to bring into the discussion in order to understand the resilience of water services. Great, Thank, thanks Tom, and uh, apologies uh, for people for hearing my voice yet again, so I'll try and make this brief. Um, it's a good question, and, and there are many different things that are challenging around resilience, because it is a, it is a relatively new, relatively, well, it's a relatively contested concept when it's been applied outside of its core uh, derivation, which was around the, in, in ecology. Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges, most of all, is just uh, making sure we get to common agreements about what do we mean by resilience and what is it that we expect from resilience. So uh, do we always expect things to be resilient only um, if they fail to, to break down in, in the face of an extreme event, 
Or do we think things are resilient if it does break down in the face of an extreme event, but then builds back very quickly and possibly better than it was before? Um, and I think within WHO, as documented on climate change and health, there's a very nice diagram that shows the range of different outcomes you can have around resilience. But I think coming to a common agreement about what we mean in WASH, um, I think remains challenging. Um, I think uh, in terms of when we're thinking about how we measure resilience, it will be no surprise, I suspect, to anybody on this call that understanding resilience of sanitation is more problematic than understanding resilience of water supply. Um, in part, that's because you know, water supply is generally uh, one piece of infrastructure serving lots of people, um, whereas sanitation tends to be lots of infrastructure serving lots of people. So there's an issue about how do you collect data and how do you measure things. Um, so I think that that is a, a forward challenge. I think um, it is also sometimes, uh, I think in terms of the practicalities of when you start to look at resilience, um, there remains a dearth of data, um, just more generally, about how we access data just on water and sanitation facilities, let alone anything else. But trying to understand events are happening, trying to understand how, how systems are reacting, um, does require actually generating more broadly a lot of data. And just finally, on, on the key point you raised, Tom, I think we need to do more work to understand uh, climate information more effectively. And I would uh, really encourage people to start looking at some of the literature and approaches around climate storylines. So this is an approach that increasingly is used, that tries to translate um, projections based around physics and mathematical and statistical constructs uh, and relate them directly to events that might have occurred in the past so that you give people a meaningful uh, thing to base their understanding on. Um, but it's still in its relative infancy. Uh, there's still a lot more work that needs to be done around it. Um, but I think the more we can develop that kind of understanding of storylines, uh, the better we will be. And I'll leave it there. That's brilliant. Thanks, Guy. So we're making progress on the, on the concepts. Um, but measurement is still challenging, especially around sanitation. Uh, there's a lack of data across the board and uh, there's a lot of complexity here. So we somehow need to uh, simplify it and, and, and convert it into, into storylines that we can, we can tell to policymakers um, to inform decision making. Um, I'd like to turn now to Nishta uh, from the World Bank. And Nishta, we know that the World Bank has uh, recently developed operational guidance for monitoring climate resilience in water and sanitation programs, but also other sectors that the World Bank works on. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about the sort of principles underlying your approach um, and the extent to which the, the data that you're collecting for water and sanitation are similar or different uh, perhaps to some of the data you're collecting in other sectors? Thanks, Tom. Thank you for the question. And I just really want to say I appreciate the remarks from Guy because they tie into, um, into what, I'm, what I will talk about. Um, there is a dearth of data, and, um, and it's, it's not just because we're not collecting the data, but this data is difficult to collect. So I think um, what I really want to focus on is a little bit of what the World Bank is doing more broadly on resilience and how that translates to our sector. So the World Bank is very committed to measuring results of climate-related operations. There's a lot of guidance that we've received as operational teams, and I'm, I'm going to try to provide a very quick and a very short summary of, of this. We recently launched the Climate, uh, climate Change Action Plan 2020, which provides very detailed guidance on our approach to climate change. Among other things, it looks at how do you facilitate a move from measuring inputs to measuring impacts with better metrics and evaluation, which is going to be, better evaluation is going to be really critical to understanding um, what we've done well, how can we shift what we've done and do it better in the future. So I think that this is a really important, um, important factor. Um, but even before this action plan was launched, the World Bank introduced guidance for monitoring and evaluation of its operations that aim to increase resilience um, to climate related natural disasters, long time, long term climate changes um, for all sectors, including for our sector. And um, I want to focus on two aspects of this rather large guidance. The first one is that 
we are trying to focus on building innovative and flexible m and &E systems that can be improved over time. And this ties back to what Guy was saying. We've got to be flexible. We've got to learn from what we are doing and how we can adapt that for the future. Um, we, the m and &E systems shouldn't just focus on accountability, but they should really take into consideration learning. For example, rec recent research from University of Leeds showed that flooding impacts in Kampala were closely linked to unsafe managed sanitation. And this can be addressed very simply by emptying pits and tanks just before the monsoon or the rainy season hits. Now, knowing that, you know, the small change can make a large shift and building that into our projects and building that into our ME systems can make a huge impact. Another aspect that I want to really sort of um, emphasize is local contacts and a beneficiary focus um, is really important. Resilience does depend on context. WASH also depends on context. It is essential that resilience building WASH operations and then our, their m and &E systems are not only specifically designed for, but with beneficiaries. Um, this includes increasing adaptation resilience at both the national and community level and building capacity at all levels to respond to the impacts of climate change. I was engaged in a project in South Asia, which focused on improving sanitation services and flood management at community level. The aim was to build capacity at local level and the utility level, and then focus on addressing policy and institutional challenges at the city and the central level. Another project in Lebanon supported activities to address key gaps in knowledge and develop monitoring tools and systems for improved decision making um, and build ownership around resilient water supply and sanitation system. In each of these projects, the aim was to bring community knowledge into the project design. Ultimately, all these factors contribute to an enabling environment for building community resilience, monitoring it, and then sustaining it. Um, we have sample indicators that we use, and I could share those with you. For example, a mitigation indicator could be metric tons of methane reduced by waste treatment plants or energy efficiency updates in water utilities. But what I really wanted to share today was some of the thinking and the guiding principles behind these indicators. Again, as I mentioned earlier, this is just really, really small part of the larger guidance available on this topic. And the World Bank is really, really committed to making a difference here. And I hope that I've been able to provide a small snapshot of that. I'll stop here. Thank you. No, that's excellent, uh, Nishta. And thanks for uh, trying to summarise a you know, huge amount of work in a short space of time. Um, but really emphasising again the, the, the dearth of data, but also uh, that this is changing the way in which we, we measure and monitor and, 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 and evaluate and the need for a sort of continuous uh, feedback loop, including information from users and from communities, uh, which is often highly context specific. Um, I'm going to turn now to Alex, um, Alex Simulawi uh, from the Global Water Partnership. And the Global Water Partnership um, has developed, uh, together with UNICEF, a strategic framework on, on climate resilient wash. Um, and this has a, a number of different pillars. One of the pillars is around uh, monitoring. Um, and I wonder, Alex, if you could just tell us um, what does that involve in, in, in practice, uh, implementing that framework? And I wonder if you could reflect on this challenge, you know, what, what are the biggest challenges when it comes to monitoring change over time? And are we making progress on that? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, and distinguished uh, guests uh, and also speakers and panelists who have spoken. Um, and also for thank you guys for the great work that you've done and also Nish, uh, Nish for, the, for the presentation from the World Bank. I, I think, in, in reflecting about your question, and, uh, we developed with UNICEF uh, four or five years ago a strategic framework for climate resilience wash, uh, which includes uh, the four steps that you've mentioned, understand the problem, appraise the options that you want to propose for intervention, deliver the solutions, and then of course monitoring and evaluation. So this work has been done, as I mentioned, four or five years ago, and we are currently in the phase where we are supporting a number of countries across uh, Africa and Asia to actually implement this strategic framework. And this data indicates that over 70 countries, uh, 70 to 80 countries, according to UNICEF, uh, are using this framework. So there is great promise. Uh, now, 
in answering your question, uh, what, what surprises me as I listen to all the discussions is now that we did the strategic framework four, five, five years ago, uh, before resilience became more the norm and it has, of course, because of the SDG 13 on climate resiliency. But what surprises me is that I can't, I'm not hearing something new, uh, despite that it's been five years since we did this work. Uh, and, and that worries me uh, in, in many ways, um, that either we are not really touching much when it comes to really going to uh, measuring the impact of the years on the ground, such that we are not learning enough from the ground. Um, because uh, what we've, the framework is still very much under implementation uh, by the countries. And there are a number of factors we identified then five years ago, which are also still very much not answered very fully at the moment. Some of the key issues that you highlight, that I can highlight, for instance, is the issue of time scales. Over what time scale do you have to measure resilience? Uh, at what level do you have to measure resilience? Because there is national level, sub-national level in the federal state, but also the local level. The level, the different kinds of indicators you think about at these levels are very different. For instance, at the national level, you'd be looking more at the enabling environment for ensuring the adoption and implementation of uh, resilience programs. Uh, when you come to the sub-national level, would you be looking more at uh, the indicators the yes, that relate to more of the sub-national watershed management in terms of how the basin as a whole is being managed? You go to the local level where the delivery is actually critical, where the communities are, then you begin to hit the uh, really look at the critical issues of infrastructure, the boreholes, as we saw from uh, the example that was presented from Nairobi, uh, the water pipes that are there. But there's also the softer part of behavior change uh, in the way that the communities live with the infrastructure. Why is it that 30 to 60% of water supply infrastructure is unsustainable around the world? Why is it that countries do not budget a lot for operational and maintenance? Because that's a challenge. Operational and maintenance is also part of making sure that uh, when you program these initiatives, whether by NGOs or by government, there's sufficient resources allocated for operational and maintenance. And as a result, in some countries, the number of infrastructure that is not working is very, very high. I can give an example of South Africa, where I'm speaking from now, 50%, 56% of wastewater infrastructure is not functioning. 44% of water treatment plants are not functioning because of not having adequate operational maintenance. And of course, there's the other aspect of skills as well. So when we begin to reflect now about resilience, there is all this challenge that we have to look at in terms of what time scale are we looking at? The issue of variability of water supply, water, water availability itself, before you even come to climate uncertainty. Uh, the issue of data has come over and over. And, and when it comes to the, how you deal with the challenges of data, uh, across most of these communities, you're not going to get the data unless you invest huge resources. And nobody's going to want you to spend that amount of money into data collection instead of spending into infrastructure. How do we bring in traditional authorities chiefs, uh, communities, the religious faith organizations to provide observed data, because in some cases that's what is needed, observed data in terms of what are the changes the community are seeing in terms of uh, the water resources availability, the infrastructure, the boreholes that are not functioning simply because one spare part or one boat is not working. And the guy who has to maintain it has to run on a bicycle from one village to the other and is not available when it's, when it's required. So there are all these practical issues that we have to think about. And then of course, there's a challenge that Guy also mentioned. There's no agreed proper indicator definition. Uh, and the fact that we don't have generic indicators that you can implement at scale so that you're able to monitor. You have very local scale specific uh, context-based indicators because of the nature of resilience and the nature of water. It's context specific. So these challenges, uh, they, they, they are there, and, and then maybe as, as, I, as I try to conclude, we need to find a way to uh, address some of these challenges, but also there's the whole issue of attribution, which comes to the issue of the baseline. 
What is the baseline? It will be different from community to community. How do you attribute the intervention that has been made to the outcome where, where, the, 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 where the, 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 the most of the attention is really required? So anyway, I'm just highlighting these issues. Uh, we have considered all this in the strategic framework we developed. I, I invite you to share it. I think it's very informative. And perhaps this community and the work that Guy is doing can help us to answer these questions as we try to support countries to implement. Thank you. Alex, thank you so much. And I'm sorry to, to cut you off because we're, we're pressed for time. But I think it shows there's a huge amount of work going on. Um, but the data is still very patchy and it's not yet standardized and we're not yet at the stage where we have those metrics to look across a lot across countries. But I want to turn to Bruce um, because Bruce, WHO um, has done a lot of work recently on supporting the implementation of climate resilient water safety planning, climate resilient sanitation safety planning. Um, and I wondered if you could comment on, on, on how that's going and the extent to which these are becoming embedded into national monitoring systems. So this sort of surveillance uh, that uh, Alex is talking about is becoming a bit more routine. Lost time because of the unmute button. Well, look, I want to start from the beginning and thanks for the question, Tom, because I, I think, you know, essentially appraisal of climate resilient WSP should be part of any routine drinking water quality surveillance system. That's what WHO recommends. And, and WSPs are, are really at the heart of our guidelines. Um, it's a central recommendation and, and everyone's sort of playing with this idea of what is the core indicator, but allowing for flexibility. And I have to say that, um, you know, sorry, just to say that a water safety plan is really looking and reviewing risks from catchment all the way to consumer in a drinking water supply system. Um, it's looking at documenting risks and mitigating them. And part of those risks um, now have to be climate resilient um, or, or, or climate related risks. And the mitigation measures are things like we've talked about, um, flood defense, um, diversion ditches, alternative sources, storage, um, filters like my colleague in, in um, Nepal mentioned for increased turbidity. So we need to auditors, trained auditors need to be able to appraise the quality of a CRWSP. And they need to do that by reviewing documentation and through site visits. And that, that is proof of the pudding of water quality. It's water quality testing and it's these audits. And we have a long way to go before we can make you know, properly audited climate resilient water safety planning a reality. And let me just conclude by, I, I feel like this intervention I'm making now is very much complementary to all the other interventions, because at some point, some decisions are gonna be made. And maybe it's going back to guys, you know, how tough is WASH kind of metrics decision-making, but some auditor somewhere is gonna to have to make a judgment on whether this pass or fails. And if it passes, then there needs to be some core indicators, as you say, Tom. Um, and I feel like that just really has to kind of be the way the world goes. And I think we have a long way to go over. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, if we want data, we have to invest in building the capacity of people to collect it and to collect it systematically at, di at different levels. Um, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to pass now to Sylvia, who's the last person on our panel. Um, and Sylvia, um, UNICEF shifting its entire WASH programming uh, towards, you know, focusing on this question of climate resilience. It's a, it's a big task and it's a work in progress. But can you tell us a little bit about, about how UNICEF is defining climate resilient WASH services and the types of uh, uh, data that country programs are now uh, collecting to, to, to monitor improvements on the ground? Thanks. Thanks a lot for the question. And uh, sure, when, when this commitment was done with our executive board, we started to, to, to do a wide research on what was being used to measure climate resilience in the wash sector. And for our surprise, we didn't um, find a lot of examples. So we developed a set of indicators uh, ourselves uh, to facilitate countries to collect data annually and report results on three main parameters. Now, the first parameter is the degree of them shifting the programs um, of UNICEF, but also from the sector into climate resilient programs using the framework that Alex was referring to that we, we did together and we launched, launched some years ago. And we consider that when countries have implemented three out of the four of the main areas of the frameworks, then we have all the elements in place to qualify as a climate resilient wash program. 
The second parameter and the most complex um, and related of what um, Guy has been explaining was to find a way to report number of people benefiting of climate resilient wash services disaggregated by water, sanitation, schools and healthcare facilities. And for this one, we decided that the services should comply with some conditions, like for instance, being able to run um, during and after clim climate events um, because they have incorporated the risk assessment results into their design to make them the worst. Another condition was that our services have a professional service associated to assure that um, they, they repair when there are damage very quickly. The washing services and the promotions have a positive, positive impact on uh, increasing community resilience because they improve issues on conservation, protection, and prevention of pollution, as Guy was, uh, as um, Bruce was talking about, and providing options uh, for a small scale livelihoods. And finally, the um, final condition was that the carbon impact of the water services provided uh, was to be, has to be significantly lower um, or eliminated completely where possible. And the final parameter that we put in place were um, to measure investment in climate resilient wash, counting the amount of funding invested in climate resilient services and associated um, systems strengthening activities in this area. So using this, uh, in 2019 and 2020, UNICEF has been able to report for the first time results on climate resilient water services, reaching 11 million people and climate resilient sanitation services, reaching 7 million people. Um, and as Alex mentioned, a lot of countries around 80 are uh, already implementing the framework and of those 46 have already reached this level that shows that they have shifted uh, to become climate resilient WASH programs. So let me end by saying that uh, what we have been hearing today is as extremely important uh, because we need this global methodology to be able to measure how much of this process robustness that the sector has adopted translates in real resilience of service and uh, for communities. Uh, we have very good examples, uh, like what happened in Mozambique uh, what, during the civil rights die. So we are very positive that this is actually happening. But of course, we need to demonstrate it by having a solid um, framework for monitoring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia, and some great points just wrapping up there about uh, you know the importance of starting to you know harmonise and standardise uh, the national monitoring, um, and then eventually. As these data uh, start to flow, uh, we can consider integrating them into global monitoring frameworks. Um, I know we're all struggling with this platform um, and uh, it will cut us off two minutes before the end. So um, I'd just like to thank our panelists uh, sincerely uh, for uh, all of the information that they've shared. And we've, we've shared the links to some of these materials in the chat box. Um, I'm now going to pass back to uh, Kellyanne uh to wrap up the session thanks great thank you so much and i i think this has just been really a um fascinating discussion um i think you know we've all heard the buzz around the adaptation agenda and certainly in the lead up to cop 26 we see the importance of um you know bringing adaptation on par with with mitigation measures um but it's clear that without being able to measure climate resilience it's very difficult to demonstrate that we are actually doing adaptation and so just I think the stakes of this are very high um, and really want to appreciate um, the thoughtfulness and um, and all of the expertise and experience that I think we're bringing in not only the climate dimensions, which for WASH might be newer, um, but it also comes back with some of the sustainability elements, which are, are not new. So I think it's really important that we, you know, we see how we bring all of this learning together. Um, and I think just to emphasize that this is something that we really hope to continue the discussion um, together with this group of partners. So we will, um, together with, with Guy and the other partners who are here, look at ways that we can continue this discussion really towards um, coming up with this type of common agreed monitoring system that can help us guide the measurement of our progress. And I think we've always seen that data and monitoring is an excellent opportunity that we can use to bring together the water and climate agenda 
um, to make our WASH programs uh, more resilient and communities ultimately more resilient to the impacts of climate change. So um, let's, uh, yeah, so let's join forces um, and see if we can, um, you know, come back next year and, and move this ahead um, with uh, some really concrete progress. I'm certain with our capacities together, we can do it. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, congratulations again to all of you who've shared your experiences um, and wish you, I think we must be at kind of the middle of the week, um, wish you kind of sustained endurance um, for the rest of the water week ahead. Thank, thank you so much.